In the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So uh, once upon a time, about six years ago, I walked into the pub at my seminary, and yes, my seminary had a pub, and seated there kind of at one of the tables uh, were 12 bishops. I know it sounds like a bad joke, right? Seminarian walks into a bar and there are 12 bishops there. But I, I'm actually not kidding, this actually happened. Uh, and, and to boot at, at my seminary, Virginia Theological Seminary, uh, things like this weren't uncommon. Uh, I've had breakfast with the Archbishop of the Episcopal Church in Sudan while still wearing my pajamas. Uh, I've met famous authors and theologians. Uh, I've snuck out onto the roof of my dorm in the middle of the night with members of the band Five Iron Frenzy. Uh, I've even given a, a visiting priest alumnus uh, and his wife a ride to the airport only to learn that she has been the accountant for Led Zeppelin since the early 70s. But let's get back to the, 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 the pub with the 12 bishops. They were having a, a pretty spirited conversation and not being a shy person, I asked if I could join them. I mean, seminarian hanging out with 12 bishops, what could possibly go wrong, right? Well, after the introductions, they asked me this question. Um, um, Ken, as, as a young person and, and future priest, uh, this, by the way, is my bishop's voice. Uh, uh, apparently, all bishops sound like radio announcers uh, uh, giving interesting lectures or something like that. Uh, uh, let's, now, 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 Ken, what do you think the reason is that young people aren't coming to church? Well, little did they know, I had been a youth minister for the last 11 years. And I felt like I knew a thing or two about young people and, and young people coming to church. So this was it. I, I finally had the attention and the ears of, of people in power who, who could make a difference. That's leaders in the church who but certainly been waiting for a, a bright young individual such as myself who, not to mention, had all the answers to tell them what was wrong in the church and further what, what needed to be done to turn things around. I knew they'd be hanging on my every word. So I, I passionately launched into my answer, and oh, I'd say about five minutes into my monologue, a, a few of the bishops looked like they were losing interest. Ah, no matter. I just needed to be more enthusiastic. Well, at 10 minutes, I, I will tell you, all of them were positively bored. And by the 12 or 13 minute mark, uh, uh, the bishop with the bushiest eyebrows uh, interrupted me and said, uh, well, Ken, uh, I, I think we've asked a bigger question than, than we had realized. Uh, thank you very much for joining us and you have a good night. Have a good night? You know, I, I'd heard of being uninvited to the cocktail party before, uh, but this was the first time it had ever happened to me. So as I quickly said my goodbyes and slunk back to my room, it occurred to me that I had just exercised a lack of authority and probably a bit of hubris in my impromptu pub meeting with the bishops. 
I'm sure you'll, you'll all probably be, be happy to, to know that I've since come to the conclusion that uh, I may not know as much as I, I once thought that I did. But let's talk about our gospel lesson today. Because in our gospel lesson today, we hear about real authority. That is Jesus' authority to teach and, and then later to cast an unclean spirit out of a man who was present at the synagogue. So I want to tell you that when I was in my 20s, I, I used to kind of run around in these circles where people really focused on the idea that Jesus taught with authority. We would talk about, you know, well, Jesus had authority. We'd talk for hours about what it might have been like to witness Jesus in all his authoritativeness in action. You know, people literally crowding around him, spellbound, aching to hear his every word. But I have to be honest with you. For the life of me, with, even with all of that talk about authority, I really could never understand why. I mean, why was that a big deal? I mean, well, why, what even was authority? I mean, I mean, well, we know Jesus was the Son of God, but, but they didn't. And from, from what I hear, he probably wasn't much to look at. And don't forget, he was from Nazareth, for goodness sake. And as we established, uh, I think it was last week, no one thought that anything of worth could come out of Nazareth. All of this, again, is to, to say that I, I really had no idea what teaching with authority really meant, what, really what it was, or why people even thought it was a big deal. You know, what was it uh, about Jesus that inspired people? What was it about him that inspired people so much that they would just drop everything that they were doing to follow him? Why did he draw crowds the way that he did? What is authority anyway? So thinking about this, we, we might say that as the Son of God, the, the catalyst for Jesus' fame was that his authority was born out of his power, right? Because it was easy to see power, especially Jesus' power. Because power, well, it's the ability to shape and influence your surroundings. And Jesus certainly did that. Power is when you influence your surroundings or people, or in the case of our gospel lesson, the spiritual world and principalities that surround us. You know, if anyone had the power to reconcile and reshape this world that we live in, it was Jesus. Jesus, the, the Word of God. Jesus, who, who was there when the foundations of the earth were laid. Jesus, the one who was and is and is to come. King of kings, Lord of lords. Authority. You know, I think authority, when you consider power, authority means that when you use your power to influence your surroundings, well, people stand by you and they support you. But you know, a person can have power without authority. You see, it's one thing to have power to shape the world around us and influence others. I mean, even the unclean spirit in our gospel lesson was able to do that. You know, we've all likely known someone at, at one time or another who, out of their insecurity, abused their power. But that, that wasn't Jesus. Jesus simply, when confronted with the unclean spirit, commands silence, and then commands it to come out 
of that poor, poor man. And I think, I think this all begs a question for us today. You know, if you think about it, that that unclean spirit had a voice, right? It was an accusatory voice. Jesus also had a voice. And I think our question is, well, in our lives, what do we give voice to? In our lives, what might we give voice to that perhaps we shouldn't? That is to say, what are the voices that that keep coming up that need to be silenced? Perhaps it's a, a voice that says, I'm not good enough. I can never be good enough. Or maybe it's a voice that says, no one understands me, and I'm all alone. I don't fit in, and I can never fit in. Perhaps it's even a voice that says, no one loves me. Do any of those voices sound familiar? I know they do for me. And so, dear church, what is it that you give voice to? What is it that you give voice to that needs to be silenced by the power and authority of Jesus? Because you see, the amazing thing is that Jesus has the power and the authority to silence and hold those voices accountable. But there's more, see. There's more because, you see, we are the body of Christ. We are the church. And we have been given power and authority by Jesus, by the second person of the Trinity. And it's here, you see, here among each other, here as the body of Christ, here in the community of the church where we hear the voice of Jesus, the voice of our Creator. And we hear that voice within the voices of our fellow parishioners. Voices that say, you are good enough. Voices that say, I understand that that even though it, it might feel like it sometimes, trust me when I tell you, you're not alone. You have never been and never will be alone. Voices that say you are loved. You are created in the image of God. You are created in the image of a God of love who speaks life into dry bones. And we, then, together as as followers of Christ, are, are called to use our voices to speak love and life and forgiveness and grace and mercy and redemption and reconciliation into the lives of others, especially those who need to hear those things the most, especially those who society has has pushed to the margins, especially those who our systems have failed and continue to fail. You see, our voices, our, our words matter. And they matter so much because our words, well, they have power. Power to accuse, power to attack, power to retaliate, 
power to give life to hurtful voices that should probably be silenced? Or our words have the power to lift others up, to encourage, to spread love. Our words have the power to silence the evil voices that people struggle with every day. And trust me, people struggle every day with these things. You know, C.S. Lewis once famously said that uh, if we knew the burdens that, that others carry, we would kneel at their feet. If we knew the burdens that other people carry, we would kneel at their feet. You see, Jesus has shown us the way. It's up to us to strive to follow him, to, to love others as he loved us, and to use our own God-given power and authority to use our voices, especially now. Especially now when, when there are so many people who aren't able to find community in this new normal, this, this pandemic. You see, we're called to speak love and life into those around us, reminding them again and again and again that they are created in the image of a loving God. Let me tell you right now, you are created in the image of a loving God. We're called to speak life into people when we say, you are loved, you are enough, just as you are. You are not alone. And when we use our voices, our, our God-given voices and authority, we join with Jesus in his church and we silence other voices, the, those unclean spirits, and with Jesus, cast them out. And in doing so, we're helping to build the kingdom of God, brick by brick, life by life, one loved and redeemed person at a time. So, If you can, reach out today to someone who you know might need to hear your words, your voice of love. Reach out to folks in our St. Barnabas community who maybe you haven't heard from in a while. Let them know you've been thinking about them. Let them know that they're loved, that we care. And let them know that they're not alone. Because with God, we are never, ever alone. Amen.